As I'm making this video, it's December 2022, and I think that's an important consideration because while there's a lot to like about Amazon's brand new Kindle Scribe e-ink tablet, there are quite a few changes that I think need to be made for the Kindle Scribe to really be all that it can be. So I hope to see some software update induced changes in the coming months. With that said, here's a quick look at 10 things I think you should know about the Kindle Scribe right now. The Kindle Scribe is the largest e-ink tablet that Amazon has released to date, measuring in at 9 inches tall and 7 and 3 quarter inches wide and about 5 eighths of an inch thick, making it big but actually even thinner than the smaller Kindle Paperwhite. Its 10.2 inch e-ink Paperwhite display has a 4 by 3 aspect ratio and 300 ppi resolution, which gives the books and notebooks you interact with a crisp look that won't fatigue your eyes as quickly as something like an LCD tablet. And that, along with the promise of a relatively distraction-free operating system, is the real reason to purchase e-ink tablets like this. Similar to the Kindle Oasis, the Scribe display has an asymmetric bezel that's about 3 eighths of an inch thick on three sides and 9 eighths of an inch thick on the remaining side. This gives the tablet an intuitive handle of sorts that can be rotated from side to side as you need. This thick side bezel is also home to what appear to be two brightness sensors, which support the auto brightness feature that can be enabled through the Scribe's top menu. Here, you can also adjust the screen's color temperature on a 25 point scale from cool to warm. The screen is protected by a single piece of slightly textured glass on the front and is otherwise encased in a seamless aluminum body that has rounded edges to make holding the device very comfortable, as well as four small rubber feet on its backside which lift the tablet slightly and keep it stable when in use as a notebook. Aside from this, the Kindle Scribe has a magnetic attachment point on its long thin bezel side where the basic or premium pen latches on. This connection is plenty secure for carrying the tablet around while reading, but I've had the pen attach when loosely thrown in a knapsack. The only other noteworthy build features are the USB-C port and power button, which are located on the thick bezel edge, as well as the magnetic sensors embedded in the scribe surface that allow it to automatically sleep and wake when used with magnetic cases. All things considered, I've been pleasantly surprised by the build quality of the Kindle Scribe. It's a little heavy, weighing in at just under 450 grams with the pen, which is more than double the weight of the Kindle Paperwhite, but it's only a little heavier than my iPad Mini 6, so comfortable to hold while snuggled up in a chair while reading, but most of the time I would want to use two hands. The only major build quality issue worth noting is that the Scribe is not rated for any kind of water resistance, so if you're planning on doing a lot of reading around pools, you may want to look at the Kindle Paperwhite or Oasis. If you're considering picking up a Kindle Scribe and you're already familiar with the Kindle ecosystem, there's very little that will surprise you about the Scribe's reading experience. The Kindle homepage provides quick access to your recent items, which now include notebooks, as well as numerous suggestions from the Kindle store, which boasts more than 13 million books. You can purchase books individually, but if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, you have access to Prime Reading, which provides a rotating catalog of a few thousand books. Kindle Unlimited is the final subscription tier, which stands alone, offering over 3 million titles for $10 a month. Alternatively, if you own your own ebooks, you can load them onto the Kindle as well, though you may need to convert the file type using software like Caliber first. More on how to load files in a minute. As an e-reader, I really like the Kindle Scribe. Coming from the Paperwhite Signature Edition, it's a familiar experience with auto brightness and screen warmth scheduling to reduce eye strain. Having said that, the screen is about twice as large, which makes reading non-ebooks like academic manuscripts or course textbooks much more manageable. The screen is only about three quarters the size of a standard letter sized piece of paper, so things are smaller than their physical counterparts, but I haven't had any issue reading, highlighting, and zooming in on journal articles on the Scribe. Within eBooks, you have the ability to jump between standard, compact, large, and low vision themes, or define your own custom theme 
by altering the font style, boldness, and size, as well as the margins, line spacing, and orientation, which can be either portrait or landscape. Additionally, you can toggle on and off a few other advanced settings that allow you to show or hide the clock at the top of the page, enable page turn animations, and identify the names of other books when they're mentioned in the text, and so on. My preference is for a portrait orientation with tight margins and text size of about 6. The biggest new feature of the Kindle Scribe is of course the ability to create handwritten notes using either the basic or premium pen. For this reason, the Scribe's home screen now includes a notebook section at the bottom, where you can see all of your notebooks at once or create a new one. You can also create folders here to help organize your notebooks, though you can't create folders within folders, so there are some limits to just how organized this structure can be. You also can't place other documents like PDFs or books within these folders, only the notebooks that are created on the Kindle Scribe. To create a notebook, you simply click in the plus icon in the top right corner of the screen. Here you can title the new notebook, then select from 18 predefined notebook layouts before clicking create. This generates a single page notebook with the layout that you selected. From here, to add a new page to your notebook, you simply swipe or move to the next page, and a new page of the same format is automatically populated. If you do this by accident, which occasionally happens when your palm contact isn't properly cancelled out, you can delete any page from the notebook by traveling to that page, clicking on the top, then selecting the three dot menu, and clicking delete current page. However, you can't move pages within a notebook, which is quite unfortunate. From the top menu, you can also access the notebook settings by clicking on the spiral bound notebook icon. Here you can retitle the notebook, set whether its cover displays the current page or the first page of the notebook, and change the page template. This is handy, but unfortunately applies to all of the pages within the notebook, so it's not yet possible to create a notebook that contains more than one type of page template at the same time. This seems like an unnecessary restriction, which will significantly limit the utility of Kindle Scribe notebooks to me. The 18 different page templates available at launch are generally well thought out and would work well together in some cases, so it seems strange to prevent users from mixing and matching to suit their needs. Currently, the available templates include three sizes of line pages with and without margins, dot grid, graph, and blank pages, as well as a mix of daily, weekly, and monthly agendas, and a habit tracker and to-do list. And this brings me to the writing experience. Overall, I enjoy writing on the Kindle Scribe, but there are a few things that you should know. First, the pen on tablet texture is good, but it's much smoother than I was expecting. It feels more like a ballpoint pen than a charcoal pencil. I found that the writing experience was much better after swapping the pen tip with one of the five replacement tips that came with the package because mine appeared to be a little blunted, but either way, the result is fairly representative of my handwriting, which is nice. One small tip I would give is to rotate your scribe so that the thicker bezel is on your palm side when writing. This way your palm remains supported when near the edge of the screen. The pen tools can be found in this little menu dot that's pinned to either the left or right side of writing compatible files. Once expanded, you have access to a pen, highlighter, and eraser tool, each of which has five tip thickness settings, as well as undo and redo buttons, and a submenu that allows you to pin this menu either to the left or right side of the page. Unfortunately, there's only one pen style, which reminds me the most of a charcoal pencil on paper. I don't mind this look, but I would like to have the ability to choose between smoother or rougher pen tips depending on whether I'm writing a note or sketching a design idea. The highlighter is fairly intuitive. While being applied, it appears as a fine hatch pattern that's then smoothed to a uniform light gray once you lift the pen. It's easy to use and I quite like the contrast it provides in notes, despite the scribe's grayscale e-ink limitations. Finally, the eraser tool also functions more or less as you'd expect, 
with a circular footprint that increases the transparency of the erased region as a preview of what you're removing until you lift the pen from the page, at which point the writing is erased, leaving a faint e-ink shadow that fades over time and won't appear in the final file, though I do find that it occasionally erases a little beyond the previewed area. The eraser tool also has two additional features that allows you to either erase a larger section by providing a lasso around that region, or to erase the entire page at once, depending on what you want to remove. All things considered, these three pen tools provide all of the utility of a standard pen on paper, but lack some of the potential that I was expecting from an e-ink tablet. For example, gesture controls for undo and redo would be quite handy. I've also noticed that there's a small gap between the page and writing surface, which can skew my perception of exactly where my pen is going to deposit its ink. This can make fine detailed work quite challenging. As you may have heard, Amazon has limited the handwriting capacity of the scribe within eBooks to blank sticky notes that get pinned within the books. However unfortunate this may be for those who prefer to write in the margins of physical books, I don't see this changing anytime soon because Amazon has indicated they want a very clean look and this approach allows them to overcome the challenges of scaling and positioning handwritten notes when the font size and margins get altered. In fact, this handwritten sticky note with its small locator is the most writing you can do in the majority of the documents supported by the Kindle Scribe. Oh yeah, and handwriting isn't supported by any optical character recognition, so it can't be searched or converted to text. For me, this isn't a big deal because I prefer the look of text notes in my Kindles anyway. But I was surprised to find that you can't use the pen directly as a highlighter. I expected the scribe to be able to apply freeform highlights to ebook pages that would then snap to more structured highlights within the same region. But you have to press and hold the same way you would with your finger to create a highlight in the ebook if you want to use the pen. Importantly, as of December 2022, Though your handwritten sticky notes are backed up by Kindle WhisperSync, so they can be accessed even if you delete the book off of your scribe, then re-download it from your library, they cannot be seen on other Kindle devices or apps. Hopefully, this is coming in 2023 as a software update, because without it, I wouldn't put much value in making notes that won't be able to be accessed on any device other than the scribe. It's worth noting that these handwritten notes can also be applied to Microsoft Word documents that are sent to your scribe. In fact, Amazon will be releasing a Send to Kindle feature directly within Microsoft Word in early 2023. But Word documents can only be exported from the scribe as PDFs with an appendix of notes, so keep that in mind. The saving grace of the Kindle scribe's writing experience are PDFs. Within PDFs, you have access to the same full pen features that you have within Scribe Notebooks, meaning that you can write, highlight, and erase freely across the pages. This opens the door to creating your own notebooks with different page templates, like this agenda template that I created specifically for my Scribe to allow me to stay on top of things while tracking sleep, exercise, and habits the way I would in a normal notebook. I'll leave an Etsy link to this template in the video description in case you'd like to buy one. Again though, there are some updates required to how PDFs are handled because even PDFs that are added via Send to Kindle are unable to display any of the pen-based highlights and writing when viewed on other Kindle devices and apps. Please Amazon, make this a priority. I want to be able to see my annotations on the Kindle desktop and mobile apps. The highlights and markups are stored within Kindle Cloud, because you can highlight a PDF, delete it from your scribe, then re-download it with the highlight still in place. But to see these pen-based marks anywhere other than the scribe, you have to export the PDF, at which time the page is flattened and you can no longer edit your handwritten notes. You can connect your Kindle scribe to a computer via the USB-C port to manually add documents onto it. However, if you want those files to be stored within the Kindle Cloud and supported by WhisperSync to back up your notes and highlights in books and personal documents, I would recommend that you use one of the Send to Kindle services. Though desktop applications do exist, 
And for some things like web articles, you can use Kindle's mobile app. The simplest method I've found is using the Send to Kindle web loader that you can access from amazon.com forward slash send to Kindle. Here, all you have to do is log into the Amazon account associated with your Kindle device, then drag and drop your files and send them to your Kindle library. After a few minutes of processing, they appear within your Scribe homepage and you can download and open them. I find this way easier than emailing the files directly to my Kindles. Keep in mind that Send to Kindle is limited to files that are 200 megabytes or less. To export files from the Kindle Scribe, be them notebooks, PDFs, some eBooks, or other supported documents, you have to email them off of the device. This is simpler than it sounds though, as all you have to do is within your file, click near the top of the screen to access the top menu. Then select the share icon that looks like a box with an arrow jumping out of it. This brings up a small share menu at the bottom of the screen, which you can use to quickly email the documents to the address associated with your Amazon account with a single click. Or share via email to up to five user-defined email addresses. It's that simple. Aside from the storage capacity, which I'll talk about in a minute, the only other variable that you need to choose when purchasing the Kindle Scribe is whether you want the basic pen or the premium pen. I opted for the premium pen, which added about $30 to the price of the Scribe, and I'd recommend that you do the same. Not because the pen itself is exceptional, it's actually quite simple, but because the Scribe doesn't support any gestures to allow you to otherwise quickly switch between the pen, highlighter, and eraser. So within a few minutes of writing notes and constantly jumping back to the pinned menu to switch functions, I'd be cursing myself for not spending the extra money to get the premium pen. Both the basic and premium pens are simple, slate gray, 8.8 millimeter rounded pens that have a small concave groove carved into their side, which allows them to snap securely onto the side of the scribe. Neither requires batteries, so you never have to worry about charging the pens, which is nice but the premium pen includes a spring-loaded eraser button on its end that when pushed in triggers the eraser tool. Additionally, there's a small side button that can be pressed and held to trigger either the highlighter, pen, eraser, or the addition of handwritten sticky notes, depending on how you configure it within the scribe pen settings. The default is highlighter, which is exactly how I use it. The Kindle Scribe is available in three storage capacities, 16 gigabytes, 32 gigabytes, and 64 gigabytes. And with no option to expand storage via a micro SD card, it's important to pick the right size for your needs. Personally, I went with the 32 gigabyte option, which I suspect is more than I needed, but I wasn't sure how big the different files would be when I made my purchase. All files will vary a little depending on their content, but in general, eBooks come in between two and five megabytes. Alternatively, one week of my PDF agenda template is about 300 kilobytes when empty and about double that once filled with handwritten notes. So my 314 page 2023 PDF agenda will likely increase from about 14 megabytes to 28 by this time next year. Not too bad really. For the device generated scribe notebooks, I found that 10 pretty full pages of writing produce an exported PDF that was 870 kilobytes. Having said that, you may not have to worry too much about the notebooks because Amazon's official press release says that all notebooks are automatically saved and backed up to the cloud for free. This combined with the ability to delete downloaded PDFs, books, and other documents from your scribe without permanently deleting them from the Kindle Cloud library means that there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how you may choose to extend your on-device storage if you're willing to remove downloaded files from the scribe then only download them when you need them. Finally, when it comes to battery life, Amazon's marketing materials claim that the scribe can get up to 12 weeks of reading or three weeks of note taking. But these numbers are based on 30 minutes of either activity per day at 50% screen brightness and with wireless connections turned off. This works out to about 42 hours of reading or 10 and a half hours of note taking. I used my scribe for a week as an agenda and e-reader with a few hours of notes and a little e-reading each day, and I found that I depleted about 44% of the battery life in five days, 
with the screen brightness auto adapting, but usually a little above half. I also had the Wi-Fi turned on. Then I ran a more controlled experiment where I used up approximately 2% of the battery life while writing a full page note for 15 minutes. Based on this, I would expect 12.5 hours of note taking battery life, which is really quite good. So overall, I'm not worried about the Scribe's battery life. I'll probably end up charging it weekly, but heavier note takers like students using it as their full-time notebook may find they charge it every day or two. Overall, I really like my Kindle Scribe. Coming from the Kindle ecosystem, it made the most sense to me as an e-ink tablet. But I do think that there are a lot of tweaks needed to make the note-taking experience on par with its potential. I plan on releasing a video to highlight some of the things I would like to see change, so stay tuned if you're interested to see that, and let me know in the comments if there are things that you would like to see changed about the Kindle Scribe. Until then, the Scribe is a neat e-ink tablet that combines a very nice e-reader with the capabilities of a basic pen and paper. Hopefully, a few software updates can make it even better. Otherwise, if you found this video interesting, please hit the like button, consider subscribing, and I'll see you next time.